<laughs> All right, we are going to go ahead and start. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, feel free to get more pizza, water um, up there, and uh, and to find the place. Um, we'll, hey, Joe, can we kill the music here? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, man, thanks for coming out. I know traffic in Nashville around this time is, is worse today than it was yesterday, much less five years ago. So uh, thanks for making the trek out here. Um, we are excited to talk to you. Um, I'm looking around here and I'm seeing, wow, we've got some really pretty important people uh, that have come to listen to this, and that's kind of exciting to me. Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, we've been trying to spread the message of the AMLC, the American Music Licensing Collective, uh, for a few weeks or a couple of months now, and this is one of those things. We also have a good number of people that are listening live on stream now. Um, we'll probably have some questions from them um, as well. But this is meant to be a casual, uh, pretty informal uh, town hall, like we said, to talk through certain things. We, wanna, we want certain things to, that, that, that we want to make sure you understand um, uh, and, and then we really want to hear a lot of questions because I think some of the strongest points that we may want to make are going to be made by questions that you ask. So um, thanks for being here. I'm curious how many, I know I've talked to a few, were at the NMPA Spotify event. Um, okay, good. Um, and that was a related but slightly different. They're talking about the CRB rates. Um, we are, uh, NMPA also has a candidate for the MLC, which we'll talk about what that is in just a second. Um, that's what we're focusing on here. I think that's not necessarily what they focused on um, at that meeting uh, for those of you that were there. So the purpose of this is to introduce AMLC and, and what's happening in, in, the, in this uh, environment through MMA. Um, and then why we believe the AMLC is different and why that matters to you. Okay, that's our, so if hopefully we're going to get that across to you. And if we leave anything out, we'd love to have questions asked. Um, I'm not going to wait till the end for questions. We'll get some things started. And then if there are pertinent questions, feel free, uh, come on up to either of these mics and they'll work. We may have somebody floating to take mics to you if that makes it a little bit easier. Um, so I want to uh, introduce um, the panel here, and, uh, and I'm probably not going to do a great job of this because I know these guys, but I'm going to try to read a few things to make sure I don't leave anything out. Um, don't forget but, to introduce yourself. And Oh, thank you, Jeff. Okay, my name is John Barker. Uh, Clearbox Rights is my company, administration company uh, here in, in uh, Nashville, um, and I've been in the copyright uh, space doing administration for a few decades now and have been very involved over the number of years in some legislative issues, trying to have a voice. That's kind of what brought me here, and we'll talk about maybe a little bit more of each of our stories as we go. Um, sitting right next to me is Hakeem Draper. Hakeem is an uh, experienced business development executive for 20 years in the entertainment and tech business. He's the founder of Cage Music, a full-service recording studio and artist development house um, in California. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and investor in several technology, music, music tech, and blockchain technology startup companies. For, former, uh, former director of licensing at yeah. Warner Music Group. Uh, jazz legend. Uh, worked with a lot of jazz legends as a composer and performer. So this is Hakeem. Um, next to Hakeem is Rick Carnes. A lot of us in Nashville know Rick. As president of Songwriters Guild of America, he's got earned over 40 platinum albums of songs recorded by a variety of artists, Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, Dean Martin, that's kind of cool, um, and Reba McIntyre's number one, uh, Long Neck Bottle, uh, oh, that's Garth Brooks, sorry, see, I told you I'm going to mess this up, right? Um, and he and his wife, Janice, have recorded a number of records together, uh, and he's currently, as I said, president of Songwriters Guild of America, Rick Carnes. Jeff, it's like Nick. a golf clap. Yeah, yeah, uh, quiet. Uh, Jeff Price, uh, I've, I've, I've gotten to know Jeff uh, really well over the last few years. I um, have a lot of respect for Jeff. Jeff uh, founded uh, Spin Art Records, co-founder of that. He was the founder of TuneCore. And then most recently, his company is Audium that he founded. Uh, Audium represents a lot of 
the digital reproduction rights in the space that we're talking about. Um, Jeff has been very involved with a lot of uh, record, a lot of artists, a lot of publishers in identification of uh, these very things that we're going to be talking about. Audium itself represents work for millions of compositions, including Bob Dylan, Round Hill Music, Third Side Music, Rough Trade, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and Jeff is a pretty much of a genius when it comes to his understanding of technology, in my opinion, as well. So welcome. Ricardo Ordonez, and I cannot say this with a cool accent that Ricardo says his own, own name with, but. Ordonez. Yeah, there you go. See, that's so cool. Uh, 25 years extensive experience uh, structuring and negotiating music deals throughout Latin America, United States, and Spain. Um, at the beginning of his career, he was part of the Copyright Royalty Tribunal hearings in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's been advocating for Latin American composers and their catalogs for quite some time. And just my short experience with Ricardo and his connections in that market and his influence in that market is pretty astounding. So welcome, Ricardo. And then last, um, I have, we had a picture up here if you saw her, but we took it off because it was not her distracting, but the flashing was distracting of uh, Zoe Keating. And Zoe, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, good. I want to make sure you're still there. Zoe is a self-published cellist and composer. Her albums have several times been number one on the iTunes classical charts. Her album, Into the Trees, spent 47 weeks on the Billboard classical charts. She's been on, in, featured on NPR Morning Edition. Um, there's a lot of things in here that she's done as an advocate, vocal advocate for rights of creators, was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum, and she was invited to participate in copyright review by the U.S. House Committee on the Judiciary in 2016. So please welcome, even though you cannot see her, Zoe Keating. All right. So that's who we are. Now, um, the only thing I want to do now, and then we're going to start letting our panelists start talking, we want to give a real, uh, as brief as possible, introduction of what it is we're talking about. Um, because some of you know a lot of this, many of you don't. And we want to make sure we catch everybody up to speed to what the MMA is, what an MLC is, and why we're even talking about it. So I'm going to try to take um, a quick minute, and then I'm going to ask Jeff. He's got a, a great analogy that he can, uh, example that he can explain on this. But the MMA, uh, Music Modernization Act, as you know, has been um, really been working on that for about the last five years, since actually the end of 2013. Um, through legislation, um, a number of us have been a part of a lot of that process at diff as different voices around certain roundtables. So the MMA was passed and signed in November. Um, and what the MMA does is it now calls for a new approach to licensing and collecting digital royalties that are interactive. The difference is a Pandora um, streaming and a Sirius XM, iHeartRadio, et cetera, those are non-interactive. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is interactive where you can choose what song you want to hear when you want to hear it a Spotify, an Apple Music, um, a Rhapsody, et cetera, those kind of things. So uh, Google Play. So uh, interactive streaming has been in the past a, a kind of a mass of uh, uh, NOI, notices of, uh, of intent that are sent to publishers, many of which are not done properly, most of which were not done properly. So therefore, most of the marketplace has not been licensed properly. MMA says, let's change that up. To do that, it calls for the creation of a music licensing, mechanical licensing collective, MLC. And as part of that, the MLC is to provide blanket licenses, identify the works, collect the royalties, and distribute the royalties. A lot that it does kind of as one body that's put together as a nonprofit entity. MMA calls for that entity to be selected by the Register of Copyrights. There, and so about uh, a, a few weeks or a few months ago, the Copyright Office put out a publication to say, if you're interested in becoming or forming an MLC, here's what you need to do. And it was filed about 10, uh, two weeks ago, the deadline, and two entities 
actually file to become the MLC. The AMLC, which is us, and the NMPA's version of the MLC, which includes um, many major publishers and many other uh, known publishers. Um, and we can talk about both of those and you may have questions with those. So there are two candidates that right now we're in a comment period, we'll talk about that, and then the Register of Copyrights will make a decision no later than July as to which of those entities, only one, would be that. And that's why this is a critical point because we want everybody to understand that you can have influence on that decision by putting in comments um, by the end of uh, a week from Monday. So, um, Jeff, but let me go to you and kind of give a little bit better explanation of the differences of those rights. Sure, and there's a wide spectrum of people that I'm sure hear and watching, and I apologize if I'm too high or too low in my descriptions. I'm going to bring it down, dumb it down for a second, and going to bring up Sony Records hiring Whitney Houston to sing the song, I Will Always Love You. Right, the recording is owned by Sony, but Dolly Parton wrote the lyric and the melody. So those are the two separate and distinct copyrights that exist in that recording. One for Sony and a second separate one for Dolly. You need two licenses, one from Dolly for the lyric and the melody, we call that the composition, and a second separate license from Sony for the recording. And every time that recording streams on, let's say, Spotify, there's two licenses and there's two separate and distinct payments being made. And that's uh, the foundation of this. The other thing that I'll do very quickly is uh, the terminology that we use in the music industry is confusing as all heck. So I'm going to do my best to try to uh, set the table on it. If you were to write a song right now called, uh, I wish I was there so I could eat the pizza, uh, you would be the songwriter because you wrote it. You would also be what we call in the music industry the music publisher because you own the copyright to it. It's yours, you own it. And then you have a third thing as well, which is you're the person or entity that's going to be making licenses and collecting the money off of that composition. And we call that the publishing administrator. So if you control all three things, you just wrote a song right now, you made it tangible, you are, at least the terminology that I utilize, is a self-published songwriter. Because by default, you are all three things, the songwriter because you wrote it, the publisher because uh, you own it, and the administrator because you license and collect. However, I could go, screw this, I don't want to license and collect. I just want to write songs. I'm going to go hire this guy who is an expert at licensing and collecting. So I can take that right of administration and give it over to Ricardo over here. I'm still the songwriter because I wrote it. I'm still the publisher because I own it. But now he is exclusively representing me to license and collect my money being generated off of my lyric and melody. So when we use the word music publisher, it applies to both self-published songwriter, where you control all three things, or alternatively, where I control two of them and I've hired him to do the other one. So that word music publisher can get a little misleading, but I wanted to define that. The majority of music publishers are self-published songwriters. The majority of them around the world. Less than like a percent of them have a deal with somebody like a Ricardo. All right, so uh, thanks, Jeff. Now, what I'd like to do, um, there's really two more things on this agenda. They'll, they'll both take a little longer, the last one will. I'd like for each of us, um, and Zoe, I'm not going to forget you, but if I ever do, you pipe in because you're actually louder than us, so you'll, we'll hear you. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want to ask each of us, starting with Ricardo, and just coming down this way, and then Zoe, I'm going to have you come in after Hakeem, which will be the fourth one. Um, tell us your story you know, quickly as to why you're a part of the AMLC. Let me make this clear as well. Everybody here, including Zoe, is a board or committee member with the AMLC. We have made a commitment to this organization um, that, that we think we are uh, fit to do this and can do it better than anybody else. So, uh, Ricardo, tell us why. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, the main reason that I'm here is uh, a basic uh, analysis and a, and a basic thought based on why the MLC was created. Um, there is the way that the big publishers are being collecting directly. They already have their license directly, let's say from Spotify. And there is a vast majority of copyright owners. Maybe that we're not the hit makers, some of them are, but there's a lot of independents 
there are in the world and in the United States that we need the MLC to be able to collect our money. Saying that, if the big group of publishers, the big, the bulldogs of the music are already collecting directly, there are their own deals, which is good for them, that's why they are the big ones. And there's a bunch of money that is not being collected, right? And as a matter of fact, there's a, this, that we're gonna talk later, this uh, black box. So my theory and my basic thought is that if you're already collecting directly here, this bunch of money belongs not to you. Or let's say, that, let's put a percentage of a mistake. There's some, some uses of your Sony, Universal, Warner, etc. right? You, ha you, you, you missed the collection. Fine, but the majority has to be independent. The majority is maybe international music. Why? Because international music and Latin American music, Euro European music, Asian music, they are not, they still don't have the technology that we in the United States have access to be able to document our copyrights. So we wanna talk about there are like hundreds of millions of dollars pending to be collected. And I am assuming, and I think that I'm right, that that majority of that money does not belong to the major uh, companies. Belong to the independent publishers, belong to the, the self-published composers, and I'm here to advocate to this majority of corporate owners, being composers and publishers, to be able to uh, create a right process and warranty them that they're gonna collect the money that belong to them. Great, thanks, Frodo. Jeff, why are you part of AMLC? So, my experiences have shaped why I'm here. <clears throat> At, as the CEO and founder of TuneCore, we were distributing between 150,000 to 225,000 new recordings and compositions every month. This was eight years ago, okay? To provide perspective on that, Warner Music Group, Warner Brothers Records, when it was at its peak in 2000, was doing one release a day. The Suma release has 10 songs on it, 365 days a year, but 3,650 new recordings a year. TuneCore alone was doing 200,000 a month. When you add in CD Baby and DistroKid and all the other DIY distributors out there, you're looking at close to about a half a million sound recordings and compositions a month being distributed out into the market. So the majority of copyrights being created, recorded, and distributed are now happening from the everybody else because technology enabled that. So that's the first thing. Second thing is I got interested in mechanical royalties one day at TuneCore. I had all these sound recording statements. I could see how many times something was downloaded in England or France or Germany or Greece because we got that information in. And I thought, I wonder how much the clients of TuneCore at that time made in these mechanical royalties. Well, the constituency of, of my company had earned about $700 million off the sale of the sound recordings. Well, through the analysis, we identified another $100 million generated by the everyman, the do-it-yourselfers, that never got licensed and never got paid because it happened outside of the United States. And I began to wonder, well, where the hell is this money? And thus began the journey. It was like deep throat, all the money. And lo and behold, I found the money had been given to collection agencies like the MLC in other parts of the world where it sat. And after a period of time, it was taken and given to Universal, Warner, and Sony, and BMG, and other publishers in those countries based on their market share. So the only guarantee was the people that earned the money weren't going to get it. And I thought that was insane. And I wanted to find a way to correct that. And that's, that's one of the major reasons. Uh, the other reason is simply this. I believe music has value. And if you want to use it, get a license and make a payment. And if you don't want to do that, fine. Go write your own song and record it. Oh, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah. That's why music has value. So when I put all that together, it's a very simple mantra. If you earn money, it should be paid to you. It should not be given to somebody else. 
if it's the kid in the bedroom in Greece or Germany or Italy or France or Detroit or Sony ATV or Warner, you should get paid the money you earn, but you should not get other people's money. There is no excuse for that. It is a wrong way to run things, and we need to change that, and technology allows that to happen. So let's fix things and get everyone paid what they've actually earned. Um, <clears throat> Jeff uh, has never been accused of not being passionate about this uh, issue. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And, and just a key thing that he said, the everybody else. I think if we talk about the AMLC and what are we doing, we're trying to make sure, as he said, everybody gets paid from the major publisher to the everybody else. But we're kind of afraid the everybody else might get left out, and we're trying to make sure that they are presented fairly. So, Rick. Yes, thank you. Uh, before I get started, I want to recognize somebody in the audience. So. Eddie Schwartz is here. He's president of CM. It's uh, the largest songwriter organization in the world. I think it's like, how many songwriters are in there? About four million. So that's a pretty big organization. The Songwriters Guild, we're a little smaller than that, but <laughs> we're considerably smaller. <laughs> but we have a two-word mission statement, and that is protect songwriters. And Eddie, in addition to being the president of CM, is also the chairman of the board of Fair Trade Music International. And I'm on that board, and the Songwriters Guild subscribes to the Fair Trade Music principles. And you should go to the website and look at those principles, because it's incredibly important that everybody understand what fair trade music really means. And if you read those principles, and then you understand that the AMLC has subscribed to those principles, then you'll understand why I'm here and agreed to be on this board, because I truly believe that the AMLC is trying to protect songwriters and give their money to them. That's great. Okay, Hakeem. So I'm, I'm third generation music business. I've seen this go every single way with artists. I've, I've spent my entire career helping independent artists from all genres and walks of life. And the thing that I really noticed when I started looking at what was happening after the, the, the act was passed was I, I started looking at these groups that are being formed. And I started hearing a lot being made of diversity. And I'll, I'll speak to you as someone who comes from fighting for minorities and, and diversity. It's not just the, the people, it's your intention. It's inclusion. Are you building a solution that's going to be fair for everybody or is it just going to be fair for the people that you're already in bed with? And for me, I saw a clear distinction. I saw diversity. I saw an approach that looked at music and what it had become. It's a global marketplace. And I saw guys with a, with a pedigree and a track record that have always walked the walk. They've always been out front. They've always been working to defend and help artists, writers, and composers. And help them get what's rightfully there. And, and frankly, I didn't need another reason. I, 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 somebody asked me if I would consider being on one of the committees, and I absolutely, without a doubt. Great, thanks, Hakeem. Um, all right, Zoe, if you're there, um, why are you part of AMLC? Here I am, can you guys hear me? We got you good. Okay, well, I'm a self-published DIY songwriter. And I've been doing everything myself since day one. And one thing you learn when you do everything yourself is how hard it is. <laughs> and so as a result of having to do everything myself, I've been advocating for the rights of unsigned and independent songwriters for many, many years. And in order to survive in this era, you have to maximize all your revenue streams, your live performances, you know, band subscriptions, sync licensing, performance royalties, sound recording. I have registered my songs everywhere possible. As savvy as I like to think I am, I still don't collect all my mechanical royalties. I didn't even start until 2016. Um, international ones, I've never collected them. I'm in that group that Jeff talked about earlier. <laughs> and uh, I'm just interested in leveling the playing field for unaffiliated artists and removing the friction and all the systems that get in the way of getting artists their royalties. So. Um, I really think the AMLC is going to do the best job to do the work for songwriters like me, which is actually most songwriters. <laughs> so, that's right. why. Thank you, Zoe. All right. And, um, and just briefly about me, I've been um, 
Uh, as I said, I've been around up in D.C. a number of times over the last number of years and been around some roundtables, and some of you here I'm seeing were around those roundtables uh, with me as well. And um, uh, once the MMA came out, I had a lot of questions. Um, I had some suggestions on some changes, and I've spent the last year in D.C. a number of times with a lot of the key players saying, here are some concerns I have. Um, wh why, is, why is the database that you're saying needs to be created doesn't include the songwriter? You know, there's two permanent identifiers on a song that never change, the songwriter and the title. Everything else can change. Why are we not using one of those permanent identifiers? Oops, we must have missed that. Okay, can we insert it? They don't. So I'm, I'm, things like that that to me are things that, you know what, somebody needs to kind of, that's in, in, the, in the trenches doing this every day, needs to ask the questions and make sure it's done the right way. Uh, I went, when Jeff Price and I were talking last October about this, I said, you know what, hold on, before I'm going to commit to this, I need to have one more conversation in D.C. and just see. So I went up there, talked to the usual suspects, and said, okay, surely there are some things in here that make a lot of common sense that need to be changed. Can we change those? One of those was, and I'll just be very fair here, was on the board of the MLC, 10 publishers, 4 songwriters. My suggestion was, can we make sure that only no more than five of those publisher members be from the NMPA board? That will force the other five publishers to truly be independent publishers. Now we have three groups, five majors, five indies, and four songwriters. Two groups must come together to be a majority. Surely there's nothing wrong with that. That seems to be very transparent and fair. That idea shot down. So I came back to Jeff and said, I'm in because I think we need to make a difference on this thing. So here's what we want to do for the rest of the time. We want to talk about the differences of why AMLC. Um, I, let me say this as well, and I'm going to try to set the stage for all of us um, on this. Um, NMPA is a very, very good organization. NSI, uh, NSAI is a very good organization. And I've worked with both of them as we have, many of us have. And in fact, the event that just took place on the Spotify rate increase, uh, was, uh, or the, 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 um, the issue with Spotify and the rates, is a great thing that NMPA does. And I applaud them and I support them 100% in that. I think it's a great thing. Um, we don't want to show why, we don't want to throw bombs at NMPA or anybody else to say why they are not good. What we want to do is tell you why we believe we are better why there are differences and specifically what those differences are. Because we think NMPA people are great people. We just think we represent, as we've said, a bit more diversity, some tech savvy people, and we have a, a, an approach that has a lot less conflict of interest to it that we just want to talk through. So that's what we'll spend the rest of the time with. And at this point, I'm going to start throwing out some topics to say why are we different. And if there are questions that you guys have on any of these topics that we're talking about, or other parts of why we're different or what our approach may be, um, uh, please uh, let, let me know. So, Jeff? Yeah. just add a quick thing, which is uh, we have someone at the computer who is reading any inbound questions that come through the link provided for the live stream, who has one of the wireless mics who uh, you can communicate with, and he'll do his best if the question makes sense to interject. There's a second wireless mic over here, uh, which if you have a question while we're speaking, please do feel free to ask it. We'd love the ability for it to circulate, and uh, don't be shy about coming up and grabbing it if we've said something that you want to have answered. And that second mic is over there. Okay. Do you want um, a, a couple of things? The tech, are the tech approach difference, and even the, the budget that goes with that. You want to talk about that? Uh, sure. I, I was thinking that it would be useful to provide some of the information around the Mechanical Licensing Collective and the role that the Board of Directors will play uh, and the conflict of interest that at least I, I believe is inherent there before we get into that. Sure. But I'm being pushed. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so, and John is the scribe. So John knows the rules and law better than I. Please do correct me, anyone on this panel, if I get something incorrect. So the Music Modernization Act passed. Now we've got the Mechanical Licensing Collective, this organization that all the music services are going to pass information to. They're going to pass the information in regards to what recording stream and give all the associated money to this organization called the Mechanical Licensing Collective. By the way, it doesn't matter where on the planet you live, what country you're a citizen of, if your music is here in the United States and it streams, these rules apply to you. 
Okay, it doesn't matter where you are, where you live. So the first thing is the Mechanical Licensing Collective has to connect the recording to the composition, to the people that wrote it, figure out how much money they're paid, and then pay them. Big job, right? Uh, now, there's going to be money that comes in where they can't figure out who to pay. They call this unidentified. The unidentified money is held for a period of time. After a period of time passes, this is in the law, that money then becomes eligible to be taken away forever from the people who earned it and be given to entities in the United States based on their U.S. market share. In other words, you earn $50, you live in Detroit, you live in, in Lisbon, you live in Liverpool, you're unaware of a lot of what we're discussing, there's a problem, your money's sitting there. After a period of time, on the new money being generated, three years, it becomes eligible to be liquidated. And the board of directors of the Mechanical Licensing Collective can say, we recommend that we liquidate other people's money. At the same time, they can be the recipients of that money. They benefit by the inefficiency. It is a weird thing that's in there. So if you have Sony, Universal, Warner as an example, the three largest music publishers in the United States, on the board of directors of the MLC, like the NMPA has put forth, those entities can then say, all this money that's sitting here where we haven't been able to figure out whose money it is, we're going to recommend to the oversight committee that it get liquidated. Oh, and gosh, look at that, we're getting it. That to me is an inherent conflict of interest. It is the way this music industry has operated for the last 80 years. And frankly, I find it abominable. It, it just, it's got to stop and it doesn't make sense. So that's, that's one of the rules that really gets me. I am going to add something like, so people understand back in the days back in the cd era happened the same thing by the way there were the these pending royalties to be paid these unidentified sums that every single record label held in their accounting right until and as a matter of fact i don't know if you remember in the cds they were like the or something when they didn't know about the composers so those cds were released they were sold hundreds of thousands of uh, copies, and that money was held in the actual record labels, um, um, uh, in the record label accounting. What happened? If you will go in the 90s and you said, oh, by the way, I am the composer, you had the right to collect that money retroactively. As a matter of fact, I did that in the, in the 90s with my company. I collect lost royalties and I went to Sony and I knocked the door and they had to pay me. What happened now? That it is an entity that is going to control that, which is the positive part of this. The, the, the money is going to came out from Spotify and Apple Music and someone, which is the MLC, is going to manage that money. And one of the responsibilities of the MLC is to find the corporate owners to be able to pay them. So it's not, it's not anymore the record label is going to keep that. No, no, the MLC. But now the worst thing that is going to happen is that if in X amount of time, maybe a year or something that the, that the law says, that money is going to be de de distributed, but not to the right owners, to the market share. Which is, as, as Jeff said, it's completely insane. I think one of the things, and, and so you know, one of the things that I was trying to, to suggest in the change of the law <clears throat> was one simple word on this very thing. The law says everything's been collecting up to this point. As soon as the MLC comes in, 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 becomes active in a little less than two years, then after one year, that money will get distributed. And then every year after that, after it's been available for a three-year period for identification. Um, the you know, sound exchange is a similar entity for sound recordings. And the law for sound exchange simply says if there is leftover money, they may distribute that by market share. The MMA says the MLC will distribute by market share. So I just simply suggested, let's make it like sound exchange and just say, we may do it, which to our discretion then to the board to say, you know what, if we don't feel like it's had a chance to be identified, then we can hold on to it. We may distribute it rather than we will. Of course, that fell on deaf ears as well. 
Rick Harns, though, you've, dealt, you've been around the table a lot of times where there's conflict of interest. So why is the AMLC better at dealing with this? Well, I have to say, first of all, I'm the songwriter, professional songwriter my whole life. Um, and every one of my songs, and I'm sure Eddie and all the other professional songwriters are going to attest, all of our songs are registered with the PLR. Right? I mean, everything you ever wrote is registered. They can find us. Okay? This is not our money. This money is going to the MLC because they can't find these people. They're not registered. A lot of these people are independent artists. I think Zoe can talk to you about that. That um, are out there making their living day to day, and some of their stuff gets recorded, ends up on a digital service. They don't even know it. The money collects into this black box, and they never see it. They don't even know it's there. Okay, the AMLC is the organization that's going to really, really dig in using this. I've said before, and I'll say it again, fair trade music principles, okay? They're going to make sure that the people who's, who wrote these songs, even if they aren't registered, okay, even if they're hard to find, they're going to dig in, they're going to find these people. And that's what it's all about to me, because this isn't my money, okay? But as the head of the songwriters guild, I have a responsibility to make sure that every songwriter gets paid what they wrote songs for. So that's why I'm interested in this. Let me add a quick uh, rule to pick up on this on Rich point, which is the way it works in the United States now, if I'm going to use your music, I have to find you, get a license from you, and pay you. The law reverses that. I no longer need to know who you are to use your music. You now have to know about the Mechanical Licensing Collective, no matter where you are on this planet, and come and register with the organization. If you're in Detroit, or Lisbon, or Liverpool, or Tel Aviv, or Brazil, or Columbia, wherever you are on this planet, you need to know that. And if you don't, you are not eligible to get paid. Now think about that. Think about the rising market share of the everyman. Think about the people that sit on the board of directors that benefit if you don't register, that can recommend your money get taken and given to them. And that's, I'm picking up on Rick's thread. I just wanted to make sure I got that point out. Sorry. Yeah, and, and I would just add, you know, I do a lot of, of speaking with independent artists, um, musicians, composers, songwriters. And you, you guys would probably be shocked at how many people have music out that they put out themselves. It's on streaming now, and they don't even have a PRO or know what one is. I did, I had a full house as big as this room in Nam last year. And at the end of it, so many people had questions about what is a PRO and how do I create an account? We spent two hours, my whole team spent two hours in the hallway after it. We helped 122 people create a PRO account. There, there's so much outreach that needs to happen and, and so much information that needs to get out there. And I, I just, I didn't see this being addressed in, in any other organization or proposal and then the other thing to me right now is i sit in this room and look at all of you very influential people i'm sure every one of you knows an artist or a composer or a writer who frankly is scared to take a public stance on this because they feel intimidated and that should concern every one of you because this was supposed to be to make our industry better it's to improve our industry why why would anyone need to be intimidated why is there intimidation can we hear from Zoe? Yeah. Yeah. Zoe, uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that uh, I've been talking for the last couple of days on Twitter and on Facebook and with various artists that I've been on tour. So I've been talking with artists on tour, some record labels. And um, it's been really interesting because um, I found that I've spent all my time just trying to explain what mechanical royalties are, first of all, and that the vast majority of people I've talked to are not signed up to collect them. Um, and there are so much, I mean, there's so much friction there. Like there's so much for an independent person to learn. And like, if you take my case, you know, I'm not suffering. I'm earning plenty of royalties from ASCAP and, and uh, you know, Spotify and my you know, sound recording royalties, what have you. But um, mechanicals are really hard to explain. And there's just such a, um, like an information gap between what people need to know, where they need to register, and such an incredible burden on the independent songwriter to register your songs in a thousand different places. Okay, that's a little extreme, but um, 
And then the fact that I really feel like the MMA is supposed to fix a problem and not create another one. Like before, you know, 2016, uh, I couldn't sign up with Harry, with, uh, Harry Fox as an individual. It was only, you know, after, <laughs> after they uh, switched, but they went to CSAC, took it over and opened up the interface so that then individuals like me, I couldn't collect my mechanicals before that. So I just don't have a lot of faith that the NMPA really cares about songwriters like me who represent thousands and thousands and thousands of songwriters. We should be doing everything we can to make this easier, to make it so that independents don't have to do so much work to collect money that is theirs and that is sitting there already. Um, and we should, the AMOC, I really feel like that's a group that I can trust that they're not going to try to obfuscate the system and and make it more difficult for me because actually this money could be liquidated after three days and they could take it three years and they could take it. Can I, can I think on, on, latch on to one thing that Zoe said that I've never said before. And Lord knows I talk a lot. Um, it has to do with trust. Zoe just pointed out there's an organization called the Harry Fox Agency, which frankly sounds like a bad porn star. But with the na name aside, got top room. Uh, name aside, the National Music Publishing Association own the Harry Fox agents. The very exactly. organization that Zoe just pointed out would not let her become a member of to get her mechanical royalties from. The very same organization that is creating the alternative to us, which is putting the exact same people on the board of directors who previously wouldn't let her into the club to get her own money. How much more glaring does this say what, Could I say more one more thing? It's not like, you know, people, they might say like, oh, well, it's not really very much money. I had an album that was on the Billboard charts for 54 weeks during the period of 2007 to 2012. You know, I was in the charts. I sold 30,000 digital copies of my album. There's some money there, but I was never able to collect it. Can, can I borrow some money, Zoe? <laughs> I'm just hey. saying it was hard in the past. We shouldn't, can, we shouldn't perpetuate those mistakes of the past into the future. I really feel like the AMLC, you know, is on the right track to try to, like, streamline this a little bit <laughs> also that i want to add um, a, a comment since we're talking about the pros and 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 the a fact that the the other group uh, the nmpa group uh, had been endorsed by the other three societies in the united states as a matter of fact the other one also the uh, global visa rights ASCA, bmi and uh, csac which is pretty much obvious because also they are in the board of their own societies but we have been endorsed by the international societies very powerful and as a matter of members may have much more members we've been endorsed by the Latin American societies by Colombia Mexico and others in Europe I mean it is a, a battle of, of of these big guys here of course ASCA BMI CISAG are huge but internationally the other societies are huge too and why is this fight for something that belongs to them? It, it, it just it doesn't make sense. If it belongs to, to independent people in Detroit, in New Orleans, or whatever, well, we need to put an effort, and the MLC is going to put an effort to be able to create this process to be able to find the right copyright owners. That is what we are stating here. Well, yeah, if you think about it, if these songwriters are members of ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, et cetera. Their songs are already registered. This is not the money that's in the black box. Anyway, for the record, we did invite the NMPA to be part of this panel and NSAI. Uh, NSAI didn't respond. Uh, right, and, and yes, and the NMPA respectfully declined. Respectfully declined. Right. Um, I will tell you that I have not had the opportunity to sit on the stage with NSAI or the NMPA to discuss substantively these issues. Uh, and I think I understand why it's a hard position to take. Under what possible scenario or world do you want to be an NSAA songwriter, a SONA songwriter, an ASCAP songwriter, a BMI songwriter, and have a board of directors who has a direct conflict of interest that benefits by not paying you? And what world could that possibly be a good thing? Let me, uh, uh, yeah. Let me, uh, I'm going to say this a few times just so we make sure we understand it. On our table, on, on the table there is this sheet. This will have two um, uh, 
uh, links that are important, uh, three links that are important. One is uh, the AMLC songrights.net. You can go there and see the information about all the board members and what's going on. Songwriters Guild of America link is on here as well. And then at the bottom, um, it says, make your comments known to the Copyright Office. And there is a link there. Um, you can go to copyright.gov, but it's a little difficult to navigate there. So you can use this to navigate there. And this should be available on our site if it's not already. Just so you can make a comment to the Copyright Office um, that will be made public after a week from Monday. And that's one thing that we're asking is, if you have a comment of something you like or dislike about this whole process, let the Copyright Office know that. So, Should we let them ask questions? Yes, and I was going to say, Peter, do we have any questions there? I have there? one question from a Holly, who is a songwriter, and this has to do with the lump sum distributions. Uh, she says, if I have a publisher, how do I know that that publisher is actually going to pay me what I am owed if it's lumped into money that is distributed by market share? This just sounds like an excuse to steal from me. That's a great, that's very difficult, actually. And, and Charlie Sanders, the uh, outside counsel for the Songwriters Guild, and I got into a weeks long discussion with the Copyright Office and the NFPA lawyers about how the money would be distributed after it got to the music company. And our major source of uh, contention here was the fact that we were saying that it should be, even if it comes in by market share to, like your biggest songwriter should get the most money, right? Uh, how is that money distributed? Is it just going to be 50% as it was in the legislation originally? That it said, or is it going to be distributed according to your contract? For instance, if you have a contract that says you get 75% of the mechanics, the publisher gets 25, well then the publisher is just compensated 25% of your royalties by saying it's a 50% floor. Well, we got to put in the legislative record that it should be distributed according to your contract. So hopefully we saved songwriters tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars by doing that. But that was an extremely long, difficult fight. And so I think it is very important that every songwriter understands how much money comes into their publisher, how it's going to be distributed by market share, and then how much of that under your contract is supposed to come to you. And frankly, I just don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know, first of all, how I'm going to find out how my publisher received this money, in what quarter, based on what, what my market share percentage was, what they received, I just can't figure it out. I don't even know who to audit. So this is one of the reasons, you know, I mean, this is one of the reasons why the AMLC is the organization that I'm involved in, because I think at this level, we can discuss that before it gets to the level where the publishers get that the distribution ought to be crystal clear and transparent, so that when it hits the publishers, the songwriters can know what they have coming to. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Dennis, I think in the back, right? You want to come up to the mic or at least talk real? Peter's going to take it back there, too. What did you say? So um, I question actually whether or not any distribution will be made to the last question. But anyway, how will you all um, administer the MMA? In other words, will you, you know, NMPA, I assume, will put bids out to CSAC HFA, to Sound Exchange, SOCAN, MRI, whoever else. Who's going to be your vendor, or will you create it yourself? Let me let me give a, a one sentence answer, and then turn this over to Jeff because he can answer this better than I. Um, we have contacted a lot, Dennis, of those same vendors that you've mentioned. Um, because of some things that have gone on behind the scenes, a lot of those vendors do not publicly want to support the AMLC, um, but have said, uh, we'd love to talk to you about this um, if and when you get this. Um, so a lot of those same vendors that are out there, we are in communications with um, and are very interested in working with them. It's just for uh, various political reasons, they are not able to go public with um, being able to that. Plus, um, no, I won't go there. Yeah, there's just been some some under some things that have been going on below the surface. But Jeff, talk about the technical bit. Sure. So we'll segue very quickly, and I will answer that specifically. 
Uh, my interest in this, by the way, is I don't have market share, and Audium doesn't have market share, and no, Audium is not the company that I would like to get hired to get paid government money to do this. My interest in this is there's right and there's wrong, and I just want to do what's right because it makes me feel good as a human being. Right, that's my interest in this. Uh, in regards to the technology approach, so there are two applications that were filed. You can see them. They're online, and they're available at the U.S. Copyright Office uh, website. We have two very different approaches in some degree. Um, the AMLC believes that we should create what we call a federated database. And what I mean by that is there are pre-existing databases and infrastructure on this planet that actually work. It's not like everything is bad. Uh, maybe we're 65, 70% of the way there in regards to understanding who wrote what, and where do they live, and how do we pay them. And there's a certain amount of money paid for that right now by the music services in the United States. Right? The music services pay for this service. So how much more do we need to pay or spend to get the extra 30%? It's an incremental amount. But the point is the Harry Fox Agency, Music Reports, these are third-party companies hired by entities like Spotify and Apple Music to perform some of these services. So Music Reports is one of the vendors that we've talked to that have agreed and they're in our application that said, hey, yeah, you can use our infrastructure. We'd like to be part of this. We've signed on. We've got good data. And we're like, great, you're tried, you're true, you're vetted, you're already utilized. Let's piggyback off of that because we will have a continuity of the existing service as a, as a floor. The number one thing is we don't want to stop what's happening from happening. We just want to make it incrementally better over time. So the first thing is you have um, uh, Music Reports, MRI is one of our vendors. And the second one is called Data Clef which is owned by SOCAN, the Canadian Performing Rights Organization, which is very advanced with its technology. This is a foundation upon which we will operate off of. Because between MRI and Data Clef, we have access to the universe of registered works. Because through somebody like Data Clef and SOCAN, there's something called SysNet, which is a pre-existing database of information that you can draw off of, of registered works from around the world. So if you're a kid in Brazil and you register with the local organization there, it makes it up with the CISNET system, or from England, etc. And then MRI has sort of these uh, Zoe Keatings of the world, self-published songwriters that might have given information directly to them, so you can complete the two together and get a wide source of information. Then our technology approach is let's do incremental improvements on top of that. Our core competency shouldn't be to be something else that somebody can already do. For example, we can either pay everybody around the world ourselves and become a bank, or we can outsource to a bank that already has this infrastructure set up. So let's utilize the pre-existing infrastructures of entities that are competent and the leaders in their space. And our core competency should be on getting data in and resolving conflicts. And that's where we need to focus. We need to be build a cloud. Amazon's got a cloud. Google's got a cloud. MRI's got a great protected database. Let's focus in incremental layers to untangle the data and then leverage off of the existing technology, make sure there's a continuity of payments while increasing who gets paid versus the NMPA version, which is we want to be the sole uh, true database where we consolidate all the information, create this new thing that's never existed before at a cost of, and I'm not shitting you, I apologize for the profanity, they want startup costs of 30 to $50 million over the next 18 months, and then an operational budget of $30 million a year with a staff of over 50 people that they're going to pay, and then they're going to bring in Sound Exchange, where they sit on the board of directors as well, to get tens of million dollars off of that. This makes no sense. I've started three companies. It doesn't cost this much money. Anyway, that's a part of the approach. The, uh, and, and the NMPA budget is actually 25 to 45 million, I think. You can see it online, but it's not, it's more than 30. Can you grab the mic so we can make sure we hear you? Yeah. First of all, you talked about the importance of songwriter data. MRI doesn't have the songwriter data. So can Mike, but MRI doesn't. Um, second of all, a question, isn't DEMA or aren't those, those the, uh, organizations that DSPs paying that 30 to 50 million dollars I don't think they want a songwriter role. so uh, the first thing correct what MRI does have is information in regards to songwriters in many cases that are not affiliated with a performing rights organization 
or a music rights organization. They created it in onboarding process. By no means is it complete. I completely agree with you. It does not represent the spectrum of the world. Even with the CISNET network, we don't have everybody in the world. So we need to have another location where we do an outreach of education and educate people in their own language, by the way, to let them know where to come, where they can then register with the mechanical licensing collective. So there's three feeding points. One is all the music rights organizations around the world. If anything gets registered there, it makes it back. The second is through MRI, which picks up some of the stragglers. And the third is through an MLC destination website where anyone on the planet can come as we reach out to them to register with us. Uh, and sorry, uh, the second part of your question was in regards to the cost. Yes, the, the cost of the mechanical licensing collective is to be paid by the music services themselves. The budget has to be approved by the copyright board in DC. So correct, although I have positioned it as if there's this magic money, no, it needs to be approved by the copyright board. And what's been put forth by the NMPA is, in my opinion, an extraordinarily bloated budget, which speaks to cronyism, nepotism, and feeding the mouth of a machine where they sit on the board of directors while sitting on the board of the very organization they don't use to recommend taking other people's money, and it makes me sick. Okay, but go ahead. I also want to add the uh, following. It is definitely key part of this process of this, of the MLC, the technological part, definitely. Without that, we're not able to continue this process. But again, I think the two most important parts of the MLC is the process, the right process, and the fiscalization. We don't do nothing spending, even if it's $5 million or $50 million, doesn't matter. If we don't have the right process to be able to put this together, right, and, and, the, and the real will to do it, and the fiscalization it has to be someone that has actually without interest, but have the interest to be able to pay people, not the interest to collect it. Also the knowledge and how to execute, with all due respect, I cannot do anything Marty Van Deer can do, or Peter Brodsky, or David Kokakis. I can't, I don't have their skill set, but the skill set I have, I can do what they can't do. I can build companies like this. They've hired me to fix their problems. And the idea that they're going to sit on a board of a technology company without that sort of skill set with a conflict of interest concerns me. Yeah, and I've, uh, can, I, can I jump in here? This is Zoe. Yeah, go ahead, Zoe. I, I, I would also say that, you know, uh, the work of matching the unmatched royalties to who they should go to is a project. And if the organization that is controlling that could liquidate that money and give it to themselves, do they have all the right motives, incentives to actually do the work? That's... <laughs> yeah, and the, I have one thing to add uh, real quickly. Has anyone ever heard of the GRD? Okay, yeah. How well is that operating now? That was a database set up by the music publishers. And what was the final cost on that? 70, 70 million dollars. And they never got it running. So it worries me that we're turning this process over to the same people who couldn't get it done over and over again. The last time they tried it was 70 million dollars. And I'm just wondering, can we sit around and wait while they spend another 70 million dollars and the money doesn't get distributed? Why don't we just do what Jeff is saying? Let's start, you know, let's fry fly from the branch we're on, you know? Let's start not at ground zero and try to build a $70 million database that's proprietary and it's only owned by this group. Let's go out to everybody else's databases. Let's set up a federated database. Let's get it going now. Yeah, I, I don't think we need another card catalog, is how I think of it. <laughs> sure. Okay, we've got another question down here, Charles. Yeah, I, I, obviously this is a very important topic. I don't want to get away from technology. But I want to go back to something that was discussed before because I'm not sure that it's fully understood. Um, it, it, closer to the mic? Sure. It, it deals with uh, fair trade music and the principles and criteria that fair trade music espouses around the world. Now, uh, we've already identified two potential uh, conflicts of interest, one being the distribution of unmatched royalties to folks who we know don't own it, the other being alerting music creators to the fact that not only the distribution has taken place, but that they have the right to receive the benefits of their own contract and not be limited to collecting 50%. Those are principles that fair trade music has been pushing around the world 
hunts you down. Are you guys signed up and affiliated with Fair Trade Music? Yes. Is anyone else? The AMLC has signed the Fair Trade Music document that when allowed by law, we are in complete sync with it in its, in its goals and its objectives. Absolutely. Because there's nothing in it to be controversial. Eddie? Yeah, up here. Yeah, back here, Eddie. This is the chairman of the board of Fair Trade Music. Thank you, Peter. Yep, thank you, Jeff, and the board of AMLC for uh, signing the MOU. We appreciate that very much. And the AMLC is the only organization, I believe, that, uh, involved in this space that has uh, signed on. So I think that's very meaningful. The world's music creators think that's very meaningful in, it, in and of itself. Uh, John, you touched upon something that I, I'd like to get a little clarity on. My understanding is, and there's a number of, there's many numbers floating out there, that currently as we speak, there is something between 1.2 billion and 1.7 billion, and I don't know how authoritative these figures are, uh, of unallocated funds already sitting around. So the question I have is, am I correct in understanding that there will be a one-year period to beat the bushes globally to find the people who, who that money should actually go to before the, that market share distribution will kick in? Or is there a three-year period? In other words, is the, that initial period shorter than what happens after the organization uh, is up and running and, and gets into regular distributions? Yeah. Is that uh, fair? Yes. And, and first of all, the figure I've seen anywhere from 900 million to 2.5 billion. So it's somewhere in between that. Um, is, is what I've seen in the press. So it's anybody's guess. It's yes. Like, yeah. But it's a lot of money. Pick and and to, to define that, what we're discussing is money that has been earned as mechanical royalties in the U.S. that has not been paid out yet. So there are these projections, as John has pointed out, between $900 million and $2.4 billion in royalties earned by songwriters and music publishers that has not yet been paid out. And the question is, because this is old money, is it correct that there is a 12-month period to figure out, once the MLC comes into existence, is there 12 months to figure out whose money it is before it becomes eligible to liquidate based on a market share distribution? Yeah, and the way the law reads, uh, first of all, the MLC effective date is January 1, 2021, just under two years. At that date, all of that money, as Jeff described, that's been collected, that will then be greater than it is today, all of that money will be handed over by law to the MLC. The law then says the MLC will pay that out after a 12-month period. Um, now, the law doesn't say, but before this other period. And to be fair, NMPA in their proposal has said that they believe that should be held for a two-year period rather than a one-year period. Our thought is, why are we taking what we believe will be by far the largest amount of unidentified income that probably has the hardest, um, it, it's gonna be the hardest to identify because it may be 10 years old and we're gonna give that the shortest fuse. So what we would like to do now, as Jeff said, we have to stay within the law because the law is the law and the MLC must abide by the law. But there seems to be a little leeway that the board of the MLC can make to say, let's hold it as long as we can let's make sure it is available for claiming and even the thing that we are interested in is can we reserve some of that money so that when it's paid out by market share maybe we reserve x percent in the event people come later to say that was my money we still have some that we can pay to them so i think that's one of the big differences we want to drill down and identify it rather than maybe the conflict of interest, let's see how quickly we can get it paid out by market share. Can we I also just, have a I just, technology sorry. approach to that too. I'll table my response. I just want to say the second part really of the question then is given that very limited time frame, and what Zoe said earlier about the difficulty of getting people to actually understand that it's in their own benefit to register and, and you know and, and to become part of this and to make sure that their works are properly registered, et cetera. Uh, it sounds kind of like an impossible task, especially when it's on a global, we're talking about a global scale. So I guess my second part of the question is, it really doesn't matter on some level, don't, please don't get me wrong, 
right now, the PROs and songwriter organizations, and certainly CM, which is you know the, the organization that represents the creators globally, including here in the United States and North America, we should be on this right now. We should already be reaching out to our community as, as assertively and as actively as possible, because this transcends this question and this issue transcends who gets the nod from the copyright office. It's it's something that either way we have to we, we should be start working on. We should start working on this immediately to get the word out to as many music creators as possible about how important it is that they're aware of this and they they stay tuned for further development. Yes, and, and we and I want Jeff to, to finish this up. But we have had conversations with the, the ones that have that very data Peter. to say, let us begin to work with you now to get to begin that identification before January 21, uh, uh, so that we can have a head start. And then the publicity and the and the outreach is a very important part of what we want to do because we want to get the, those words out. But Jeff, that, or, sorry, sorry, no, that that's why process is key in this part. I mean, we even if we invest and. and our knowledge to be able to put together the MLC, definitely the corporate owners and the bodies that re, that re, uh, present them, for example, CSAC, which is the international PRO fiscalization entity, they should be involved in all this. For the process, they need to locate titles in billions of lines. Second, they need to document those titles to be able to start this process, right? And that is why the process is so key. I mean, we need to involve everybody that owns copyrights in the world. I, I, I'm, I, we need to ask the other side if they are willing to open this black box worldwide. The key question here, are they willing to get access to every single PRO in the, in the, in the world? I have my doubts. On the technology, gentlemen with the microphone, You've had a question for some time, and I apologize. I wanted to answer Eddie. You know, I thought a lot about that point that you've made, and it occurred to me that we are, it is inappropriate at this time to suggest that there is a complete technology solution in place, be it us or the NMPA's version, without first sitting and engaging with the digital music services, who we should work with collaboratively. And so to that end, if it was up to me, if I could wave my magic wand, I'd be sitting in a room with the digital music services. And I would say, let's go through and analyze the money that hasn't been paid and let's do it off of the sound recordings. Because you know what sound recordings have streamed where there have not been the commiserate mechanical royalties paid. So let's do a stratification first and see who has distributed the, what sound recordings. And you get buckets. These came from TuneCore. These came from DistroKid. These came from CD Baby. These came from Sony and so forth. Okay, now let's do the next stratification down. Let's look at the stream counts. So we understand which of these sound recordings have generated mechanical royalties. And let's see where those are coming from. Usually my assumptions are wrong until I do an analysis. And we might discover that it's coming from, I'm making this up, it's coming from Warner. All right. Maybe it's coming from TuneCore. Okay, so if it's coming from TuneCore, then I would turn around and say, what we need to do is engage with a conversation with the distributor, send them back their own metadata. They know the person that gave them the sound recording and tell them to reach out to that person to get information that can come back that we can repopulate in to help clean up part of this mess. Uh, if it comes from a major distributor, fine. Now the other part is, let's do a stratification based on what percentage of the composition is owned. For example, there could be $100 owed in mechanical with 0% ownership on the composition versus 100% generated mechanicals where $50 of it, of it has been paid out and the other $50 has not. Well, if it was up to me, I would not put the other $50 if you've got an ownership percentage on the composition into a black box, because that's just a matter of time, right? That's not something to be taken. So I would do the stratifications through a technology interface, working with the DSPs, looking at the conclusions, creating white papers that I would send out to the distributors to reach out to the constituents, Taking money where we know, well, hey, it's just Drake and one of his 27 friends, and we've got 15 of them registered, so we can stick that money aside. No way in hell would I say we should distribute this based on market. Hey, question back here. See, that's the level we need right there. We, we need somebody who actually understands this system. You know, and isn't just going to say, okay, we're going to put up a website, and we're going to say, here, come and register. You know, because it takes forever just to reach songwriters. I mean, 
if, if we're giving away free pizza, as you can see, it's hard to get a lot of songwriters, you know? So you really need to have somebody that knows how to dig in, talk to the people who actually have the data, and then get them to talk to the people who actually might be the creator. Okay, is, we're gonna... can, can I jump in for a second? Yes. I, I just want to say what you just talked about, Jeff, is exactly what I trust the AMLC to do and why I wanted to join the board. You know, look at like Sound Exchange. They still, they spend so much of their budget just trying to outreach, trying to get songwriters recruited, and they're still sitting on all that money. And I really believe the AMLC is going to do what it takes to do the matching without songwriters having to do all the like, work for them. Thanks, Zoe. Okay, we've got a question back here. We're going to get to that. Well, I, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm and the sincerity that all you gentlemen and ladies uh, have uh, regarding this issue. The, the two main takeaways that I've been able to uh, gather today is the black box and uh, having songwriters uh, and publishers uh, uh, be aware of their duties uh, along with creating. And I think that imagining that somehow miraculously whoever's in charge of this black box is going to be able to come up with an easy fix to find these people and say you haven't given us your updated information in 10 years would be somewhat naive. Uh, being a publisher, I know even though songwriters love to get a check, they sometimes are their own worst enemies by just not staying in touch and letting you know where they are. And so that to me is the main issue, and that's why I was interested to hear what this gentleman had to say about contacting the people and going beyond the block black box back to the uh, its origin to make sure that the songs are correctly registered and the information is correct because even as a publisher knowing that my catalog has been sent around the world many times every time it changes hands with a different sub publisher the information if it's incorrectly registered at a PRO or at a, a, another organization, then you have to go back and correct that constantly. So I can understand how over the over time many of these songs end up in black box. And to be quite honest with you, as unfair as it's been, how else would you deal with this? How else would you handle that money? It, it has to be allocated sometime, someplace, and you have to use some formula to do that. And I'm guessing that your organization will end up in the same position because there's always going to be money that cannot be identified. And you're either going to have to just sit on it forever or you're going to have to allocate it to somebody at some point. So that you're going to have to really drill down on. I think that's an issue that, that really has to be thought about because I can see this just being perpetuated over and over again. I think you're correct. It is an issue and it's one that honestly we don't have all the answers to. I think what we're trying to say is the board and the makeup of the board and the conflict of interest or lack of conflict of interest is going to be important as we try to think through all of those points that you just brought up. Because we don't have the answers, but what we, what we believe is there is less conflict of interest here because we don't have a market share that's going to end up in our pockets that's anything material. And to that point, the, the SGA, who I totally think does a terrific job, uh, Thank you. Part of the education that needs to be done, I think, is through the SGA because even after you start allocating those funds to people and say, well, what does your contract call for? I'll guarantee you 99% of them are not going to have contracts. Yeah, they, they lose their contracts. Lose we have this contracts. all the time. They, they don't come know. In. They, they don't come know. in and they say, well, we want you to do the audit for us. We say, okay, well, let us see your contracts. And they say, well, I don't have my contract. Um, songwriters are not exactly famous for doing paperwork. And this is, uh, that's, a, that's a joke, by the way. Um, they, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to have somebody like Jim that can actually go in and search through the data and parse it in ways that would allow the MLC to find the writers as opposed to the writers finding the MLC. Because frankly, the Songwriters Guild does all the educational stuff 
and still we don't get the message out because it's hard to reach everybody everywhere. And frankly, probably the majority of this money is international money, and the Songwriters Guild is the Songwriters Guild of America. Okay, so we need CM, we need the international organizations to all link arms and help us reach these people. I agree this is you. this is uh, Zoe here. Can I? Sorry, I can't see you guys to, to know to jump in here. But I was going to say to just uh, speak to uh, the speaker just now that both the groups that submitted proposals to the copyright board, the NMPA and the AMLC, will have this problem of data matching. <laughs> They're both going to go through this, and it's like which group do you think is going to go the extra mile to try to, you know do all the messy data analysis, which I, sounds really fun to me as a former data analyst, all that, who's gonna do that? And I think it's gonna be the AMLC. Yeah, by the way, I do agree with you very much. We will never be at 100%, ever. Not gonna happen. Um, but it turns into also motivation. What's the motivation? Is it, well, screw it, let's just black box and distribute it or let's keep trying. So that's, that's where that passion comes from. That said, I fervently believe that you can probably tell that our technology approach superior. I believe the mechanisms that I've just described, the other side hasn't even contemplated in, in regards. I also believe that at the point of birth, as I call it, the distribution, there should be a requirement in the metadata by the music services that says you must include the songwriter and publishing information. Now, I do understand the response back to that is yes, but we can't verify if it's true. So I'm going to take a page out of Apple's book. Apple with iTunes began to have a problem, as I understand it, with copyright infringement on sound recordings, not compositions, where people would upload recordings that they did not control the rights to, and it would create an infringement issue. So they created a system where they began to do random sampling of the sound recordings that were coming in from the distributors and began to see how many times there were conflicts or, or errors in the metadata, and they began to grade them. And if you got a bad grade, you would get punished, where they would create a latency between when they received the recording to when they would make it live, creating a competition. I was still running TuneCore at the time, so all of a sudden I was like, well, damn, we got to be better than CD Baby because the stuff will get live, the music will get live faster than music services. And then we upped our game. Right? The same thing can be done on the, on the composition side, where, yes, when you start, there's going to be some bad data coming in. The veracity of it might not have yet been figured out. But as you begin to do random sampling over time, you're going to see patterns emerging, right? And you're going to find you're going to have a healthy competition between these distributors because it's the DIY constituency, which are uh, the most represented by the MLC with this black box problem. And the, the music uh, distributors are going to want to be better than each other. Help downtown music just bought CD Baby for, what, $200 million, right? They want to be best in show. TuneCore was bought by Believe Digital. They want to be best in show. Distro Kid, they just closed around the front. So they're going to start competing with each other, and that data is going to get cleaned up. And I think over three, four, five years, you're going to begin to get an efficiency. So the past, the way I like to think about it, is the ship has a hole in it. It's filling with water. Patch the damn hole. All right, so let's stop water from coming in. We still got to go in and bail out the water. That's the legacy we got. But we can stop the water from coming in through best practices and new requirements. And ultimately, it does not benefit me not to pay you. And I think that's really important as well. Uh, other questions? Um, we're not going to prolong this uh, because I know it's evening and we're downtown Nashville. And it, and there's, there's a, a gentleman Preds over there. Going on. On. Oh, there's a uh, where? Over? Hey, Peter, behind your. Oh, there we go. Tony? I'm not sure this is a, a comment as much as it is a question, but it seems like with the MMA, we had some kind of a collaborative settlement between sound recording providers, digital music services, and music publishers slash writers. And there are certain aligned um, interests involved in the thing. I'm curious as why is there do there doesn't seem to be an initiative to create some kind of a global release identifier, like a uh, a unit of publication that we register, uh, perhaps at the register of copyrights, that identifies what is actually going out and that we can attach to. Why are we always trying to 
seek out these the situation backwards? Uh, I can answer that in in two words: black box. That, that if stuff goes in the black box, but, but I it accrues to I, I, the I advantage agree. of the people uh, who's I, messed it up. I, I agree with you, but I didn't see that advocacy in the AMLC presentation either. Uh, I read both of the submissions, and I'm curious to know why we don't have that. Well, the Songwriters Guild uh, spoke to the Patent and Trade Office uh, at a panel in, in which we pointed out the fact that the one piece of data that never goes stale because publishing information will change. There's thousands of different records on what's it. The one thing that never changes is the creator's name. Okay. Indeed. So we need a creator's ID number as the basis of all data files. Yeah, and I think the, the ISNI is a good start. That's a good start. At, at, a and, good and Jeff start. and I have had conversations. But at, but at the same time, the definition for the unit of publication never occurs. And so we're always working backwards. I mean, theoretically, you should be able to to create an audit trail from the lowliest creator from the at, at the recording level all the way to the to the publication. But there has to be a, 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 a single master ID, a unique identifier. I don't see anybody advocating for that. I believe a lot of people are. I think in separate entities from the AMSC are working on something like that, with the idea of the Creator Passport. Image and Heap has a project um, to try to do a creator identity, so you enter all your information once, instead of everybody you know, having to enter it multiple times. But uh, I think a lot of independent songwriters like me, yeah, we would love to just be have to go to do it once instead of a thousand times. But um, that's a whole other discussion as to whether the complexity, people profit off that complexity. <laughs> We've even had discussions, the Songwriters Guild had discussions with software, music software creators saying, can we bake this into the original file? Can we have a creator's ID number in the original music file? I think Eddie's talked to some people about that too. Yeah, Eddie, you want to add? Yes, but if there's a watermark in that file with the creator's number or name in it, that's at least one way to parse it. Yes, it's one of many. I'm not saying it's the best. It's just things we've had discussions about. It is under discussion. So the standardization, so the question, so my understanding is we had a unique standardization in regards to identifiers that we all agreed we would use. It would help solve the problem. Um, sure, I'm all for that. Yeah. Well, but <laughs> the one that's missing is even in the publication is what the gentleman said for those listening in. Part of this has to do with the digital music services. They have to subscribe to that as well because the ability to map, match, and pay is contingent upon the data that they provide. So they have to agree to that and then include whatever identifiers we all agree should be there in the output in order to be able to utilize it. But great, if we can do it, sure. But I, now I need Spotify to not to use their own unique identifiers and Apple not to use their own unique identifiers and Amazon not to use their own unique identifiers, and, and so on, and it's all proprietary. But you are correct. It's an interesting solution, and one that should be explored. And because you're about to wrap up, I want to make sure I say this. The NMPA is a good organization. They have done great things. They are down the street. They are fighting to increase the royalty rates that songwriters and music publishers should be paid. However, I believe that that's where their role and responsibility should stop. Paying people the money they earn should lay with us not with an organization that can benefit by not paying people. And that's how I see the bifurcation of duty, by the way. And NSAI is a great organization. Sony is a great organization. Songwriters Guild is a great organization. And frankly, I'm flummoxed as to why we are not sitting in a room together, working together to solve this freaking problem, and why we have to be on opposite sides of a fence attacking each other. It's not about what's best for us, it's about what's best for you, and the enemy is inefficiency, and the goal is getting people paid, not taking one side out over the other. And I will tell you, hand to heart, I have tried till I have been blue in the face to sit with that other side to talk with us, and they will not do it, and I don't know why. And even the press have uh, contacted us, and we have been in the, in the press, and they contact the other side to be able to have uh, uh, debates. They have not, they have not accepted. 
questions. They don't have the arguments. All right, we're, we're going to wrap up, but we've got uh, George got a question. And if there's another question, let's go with George, and then that'll be the last one where somebody really kind of waves their hand. And then I'd like what I'd like to do is have each of us give like a 30 second closing comment. Um, and, and Zoe, I'm going to start with you. Um, once we finish with this one other question, unless another one comes up. George? I was just going to make a comment. Uh, to me, the reason why is <coughs> NMPA didn't count on an AMLC being formed. They thought they had it in the bag. So to me, uh, everything they're doing with the Copyright Royalty Board, the NMPA, NMPA does and the RIAA, they represent three major labels. And they used to be American labels but they're all foreign owned. And I'm all for the free market and all that. But uh, one of music's in Moscow. Sony's always had Columbia and RCA in Japan. And Vivendi owns Universal, and they're in Paris. So we have three foreign companies determining what American songwriters do, copyright rates in general. And NMPA represents those three major foreign labels and publishers. So competition is the same. That's why these guys walk into the copyright vote board and set the rate at zero and go, Your Honor, you know, what are we going to do? The government said we have to set the rate at zero. And make sure that every American songwriter and publisher gets nothing, point zero zero zero. And uh, I don't think NMPA wants any competition. And that's why they don't want to sit down. Because uh, it's their show. They want the money. And uh, they want to control it. And I really hope that you guys get it. Because I definitely trust you. Over in MPA. And I don't think they really care about the song. Well, thanks, George, for saying that. And and um, and again, I want to remind everybody, and Ted, I'll come to you. Uh, I want to remind everybody uh, to pick up this sheet, take it with you. So you can go to songrights.net to our site, as well as make comments to the Copyright Office. Um, and Ted, let's go to you. And this will be our last, unless somebody else. Uh, Peter, he's right over here in front of you, right in front of you, right there. I'm going to do a quick Carol Burnett. Kira, night. Okay. Uh, okay. So the 800-pound elephant. 99% of this is what what happens when the money is in-house. I mean, that's one of the greatest things about the MMA. At least it brings it out from the DSPs into our community. You know, and this is a big problem, but it's a good problem to have. We're just trying to figure out how to pay us, right? And that's and our and our big issue here is well, those people who have, have however we've described them, you know. That have not registered, and that, you know, we want we want to make sure that the rest of them get their fair share. Is there any aspect of the, the creation of the MLC or, the, or this whole process that, or is there a part of this that, uh, or, or what focus I should ask is there in terms of actually getting the money from the DSPs? Is that just considered? Well, that's just going to be no problem. We've got the we've got the law. They know where to send it. We assume there's not going to be a problem. Everything we're talking about, assuming we get all the money, how do we figure out how to pay who hasn't been registered? That seems like it, I don't want to discount that, but is, is that the only problem that we really have the issue? What is the other part of making the DSPs actually play ball? And yeah, and let me, I'm, and Jeff, you, you, you've been our spokesperson for the, for the, for the team. Our, our so the, the, Digital music services are technology companies, and as such, they create business logic and code that does certain things. So if they code it correctly from inception with the right business rules, X percent of revenue based on Y calculation, it will permeate across everything that happens and just become a kick out in the monthly profit and loss spreadsheet. It makes it very difficult, particularly for a publicly traded organization, to hide money because then you need different code base. Literally, you have to have an engineer be able to create a, a covert code which somehow applies differently in different ways. And if that ever gets found out and they're publicly traded, they're, they're done for. So I, I feel comfortable, although it's never going to be perfect, that the code that has been written to calculate these royalties has been done with the correct business logic and will apply across the board and that money on the P&L, profit and loss spreadsheet, will indicate, okay, this month, the total amount owed for mechanicals was, you know, $80 million. You know, here you go, MLC, and that's just off of our books as a liability. It, so I have confidence in that. And yes, I think it's an interesting way to sum it up. At least we can get the money out. Now we got to get it to the 
owns it, and it, and it scares me because I've sat in rooms with many of the major music publishers who said, well, three years is long enough, if people can't find the money, you should be able to take it, or all the money that YouTube is sitting on. Uh, they should give it over to the NMPA, and we'll just deal with distributing it. And it's just like, oh, my God, you, you can't mean that. What harm comes to the world if you hold on to the money for a little bit longer than three years? I mean, maybe you won't get your bonus this year, but outside of that, what harm is it? Yeah, I do think the money. Well, so the question is, what is an acceptable amount of time? I'll very quickly answer that with a, a short anecdote. I grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, last year, I went online to the uh, treasurer of Massachusetts to type my name in. Turns out they were holding some money for me, $51.67 from a savings account I had in Brookline, Massachusetts when I was 10 years old and I moved out. I'm 51 now, I filled out a form, and I got my money. You know, it's 40 years later. I don't know, but I don't think three years is an appropriate amount of time, particularly when we need to educate the world uh, and songwriters. By the way, less than a percent of the world's songwriting music publishers are affiliated with the NMPA. They represent less than a percent of the world's songwriting music publishers. So I think a lot longer than, I don't have it, I don't know, 10 years, 15, why not? All right, we're John, gonna wrap John, it up. Really quick, quick hitter here. Oh, okay. Um, for the folks that are online who aren't here with the great flyers that you made. Um, he says, where and how can someone make comments on the copyright office? Go to the site copyright.gov and on the right side of the screen in the lower right box, you will see something that says Music Modernization Act. Um, and push on that button and then follow it where it says comments. There's a long URL that Jeff is holding up to the camera there. If you go to the site, um, it says Orrin Hatch Music Modernization. And what we will try to do is if you go to songrights.net, we will try to have that available tomorrow if it's not already there. So anyone can go there and, um, and click on that and find it as well. Okay, so while they're doing that, uh, that's all. We're going to wrap this up. Zoe, I'm going to come to you first, and then the rest down the line with Hakeem going down that way. Ask you guys for about a 30-second wrap-up of anything that you would like to say that hasn't been said already. Well, I think it's all been said. Just as we can hear, these seem like complex issues, but really it's simple in the end. There's two groups here who have put forward bids to get mechanical royalties to songwriters. I think the AMLC is gonna do the best job to get the royalties to musicians like me. That's it. Thank you, Zoe. I think, um, as I mentioned in my intro, intention, the intention of, of what these guys are doing, the, the effort to, to do the outreach, to find these composers and, and songwriters who haven't yet created these accounts. I think that these are all the things, and then the, the feedback that we get from rooms like this, where you start asking some really good questions that a lot of people are, are missing, because this is, this is all very nuanced and complex, but at its core, it's a tech move, and I just don't trust the other guys with the tech. I've seen what they can do with tech, and it hasn't been good. All right, Rick. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank the people online that you know you haven't been able to see, but I know they're out there because we made contact with the songwriters. I want to thank you for caring and showing up for songwriters because this is a very critical issue. And I think everybody needs to get both of these organizations. I think you need to go read everything that the NLC has published. You need to read everything that the AMLC has published. And the Songwriters Guild, one of the things we've told songwriters for 87 years, don't ever sign anything you haven't read and don't ever support anything you don't understand. So you need to understand both of these organizations. And I think once you do, I hope that you'll choose the AMLC. Now, Jeff, remember I said 30 seconds. Okay. So technologically, we're more advanced and we're better, period, hands down. We do not have a conflict of interest. We just don't, and our intent truly is to get people paid. Look at the two applications, look at them in front of you, and think which one of these two organizations is more likely to get them paid. It's us. It's us. Ricardo. Our duty as a member of the board is to fiscalize this uh, process. And, and I think that we are, we have the experience and the capabilities to be able to do that. Um, and to have the satisfaction to be able to pay this kid in India that uploaded this song $50. So that kid 
I'm gonna show you, or some kids are gonna quit whatever they're doing to be able to go and compose and create. And that's what this money could be. Could change a lot of people in the world and a lot of families in the world and for, for good because music is what really runs this world. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And, uh, and in closing, uh, Ricardo, very well said, the differences, tech approach, as Jeff said, the budget, less conflict of interest, NMPA, let NMPA continue to do what they're doing like they just did this evening with the Spotify and the rates. Um, let somebody else control um, the, uh, the technology and the money. Uh, more diversity. Uh, we're actually people who do this stuff that we're talking about. That's been our background. We welcome oversight. Oversight has been argued by NMPA in some areas. Um, and we are for the everybody else. So if that is, nobody else has anything to say, and I'm not going to stay long uh, for that, then thank you very much for coming. Please go to the site, get more information. Thanks, we're around Zoe. to talk later. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.